Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania zu Sahel, zu Afghanistan, zu Irak, zu Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Oliker, and I'm welcoming you back to a whole new season. And this is Hugh Pope, Olga's co-host, joining you this week from a rainy Berlin. So to get the season off to a excellent start, we are pleased to welcome Lord Mark Malik Brown. Lord Mark Malik Brown has had quite a storied career. He has been a journalist, a diplomat, a politician. He has worked at the United Nations including at the High Commission for Refugees. He's been Development Program Administrator there and Deputy Secretary General. In the UK government, he was Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Most recently, he has chaired the Best for Britain campaign, seeking a way to reverse uh, the United Kingdom's plan to Brexit, which is to say to leave the EU. He is co-chair of our Crisis Group Board. So thank you and welcome, Mark. Thank you. So just to get started, what happens? What are the options for a Brexit deal? Well, we're now right in the hairs of the final phases of the negotiation at the end of the transition period. Both sides agree. Really, by the end of October, there's a deal or not a deal, because there's then a need for a couple of months to get it. If there is a deal to get it approved by the different parliaments across Europe. What's the deal going to look like? The one thing we can say at this stage is whether there is a deal or a no deal, they will actually look quite similar because any deal would be a very limited one at this stage. There simply isn't time for any very comprehensive agreement. And you might anticipate that a lot of the negotiation would under some formula or other get knocked over into the future. So I think for planning purposes, we can all agree that far from, you know, a deal which recognises in a comprehensive way the adjacency of Britain to Europe geographically, the integration of the two trade systems, you're going to get something which is going to kind of put new complication, new cost, new controls and border delays of some kind in place. It's, It's not going to be the kind of deal that many of us had hoped for. And so does this mean that there's going to be real damage because of the pandemic and because everyone seems to have moved on after four years of debate? People in Europe are not discussing it very much, and yet we're beginning to see some of the implications. But do you think that there's going to be a real hit for people in January next year? Yes, that, of course, is why a lot of people cling on to the hope there will be a deal of some kind. There's this feeling, how on earth could you double up on the pain when we've already got COVID by then introducing a kind of self-imposed wound on top of that, you know, a Brexit break with Europe. The other reason that those who hold on to the hope of a good outcome point to is the politics in Scotland, where a very strong SNP government seems headed towards a big win at the polls next Next year, there's disarray in both the Tory and Labour parties north of the border. And it has made its number one manifesto commitment a new referendum on independence. And of course, the what's feeding that is that Scots voted by a large majority in favour of staying in the EU. And so, you know, a bad Brexit is only going to, in the view of analysts north of the border, enhance the demand for Scottish independence. So a government which bruises on and does this, you know, is inviting a lot of trouble and a reinforcement of the already considerable economic difficulties we're facing across the whole country, north and south of the border. But you're not optimistic that they're going to sort it out and find a good way forward? I'm not optimistic. It's really strange because there are two outstanding issues which both sides agree are at the core of the block in negotiation progress. One is fisheries, which is a minute proportion of jobs and economic activity in both Britain and Europe. And yet it's a totemic issue. You know, it's one of those issues of rural livelihoods, which tear up politics all over the world all the time. And there is a feeling that probably there's a deal because, you know, Britain does need a bigger share of its own waters for fishing or the catch from those waters. But equally, it needs to sell that fish 
into Europe. So there's a base for a deal, I think. Both sides will climb down a bit. The bigger issue is one which is astonishing the way it's morphed, because when Brexit was first raised, uh, the fear was that the Brexiteers were going to build a sort of Singapore on the Thames, a small government, low tax, low regulation economy, which would undercut Europe. Now, suddenly, the Johnson government, with this sort of guru in the background, Dominic Cummings, is actually proving to be potentially one of the most interventionist governments in Europe, from spending less on state subsidies than its European counterparts in the past and having led the rules in terms of the debates in Brussels to limit state subsidies and done that under both Tory and Labour governments. Now, suddenly, this is a government which doesn't see a business that it either wants to rescue or invest in, in terms of you know, a new technology future for the UK. So Brussels has said, began by saying you've got to be aligned on state subsidies. They've backed away from that to say you've at least got to show us your framework for state subsidies so that we can satisfy ourselves that it's not going to give you an unfair advantage, your business is an unfair advantage. And you've got to allow some dispute mechanism for us to be able to punish you with tariffs if in certain sectors you do use too much subsidy in the future. And this government, which is a chaotic beast of a thing, is quite unable to get its head around a subsidy policy which it should show Europe and which may, might or might not satisfy Europe that it was a basis to proceed with the deal. So, you know, in just a few years since Brexit began, the Tories have turned from a small government low tax party to a big government high tax party, driven both by ideological changes at the top, but also, of course, the impact of COVID. And so, you know, this is proving a hell of a problem to solve. And, you know, there just doesn't seem to be sufficient will or organisation within London to solve it. That sounds like a big mess in, in London. But what about in Europe? In January, is there going to be big damage there? I mean, hardly anyone seems to be even talking about it anymore. Angela Merkel hardly mentions it. Where do you think that the, the hit is going to come there? Well, look, you know, in terms of relative GDP dependence, you know, individual European countries are, you know, much less exposed to British trade than Britain is to Europe as a whole, obviously. So the majority of the economic hit is going to fall on, on the UK. Okay. But there are obviously sectors and, you know, you mentioned Germany. Well, German cars have a big foothold in the UK. And for a long time, Brexiteers have always argued that the Germans would, you know, back a good Canada style deal just to protect their auto sector. But, you know, as you say, Hugh, frankly, in Europe, the conversations moved on. And I'd even argue that, you know, in many parts of Europe, there's a relief that Brexit's behind them, a feeling that great sentimental attachment to Britain, a respect for the role that Britain played in 20th century Europe, but a feeling that it wants to have its own path and go into what most Europeans would consider, you know, a hopeless cul-de-sac of, of future economic disappointment, but that for Europe, Britain's departure has actually given some freedom to get on with an agenda of European reform, which was constantly blocked by the UK's presence. And for example, the big rescue plan, this the recovery plan that Europe has adopted, which is an big step forward, of course, in terms of internal European cohesion. The group of four countries that opposed it would have been five if the UK had been there and the outcome might have been different. And therefore, I can only imagine that within the quieter, more private councils of Europe, there's actually a, a sense of relief that the majority of the Brexit problem is behind them. So how do you see post-Brexit Britain and post-Brexit EU working together? Is it going to be a contentious relationship? Uh, will they be able to develop any kind of alignment on foreign policy? Well, the optimistic view is that while there will be a huge number of issues to sort out, given how intertwined the economy and security and foreign policy systems are, that, you know, once the December deadline is passed, it'll happen in quiet, anonymous negotiations in committee rooms in Brussels, and occasionally London, you know, the press will have moved on. And, you know, because even here, frankly, the press is much more preoccupied by COVID than Brexit. It's a semi-forgotten issue here as well. But 
you know, I think while that could be an outcome, in truth, because the deal is going to be so limited or not be a deal at all at the end of the year, that very contentious issues are going to get kicked into next year. So my worry is that actually far from the deadline draining the poison and allowing quiet, rational, low-key negotiations in the future, it's going to actually store up a lot of poison for the future negotiations, which will cross, in fact, areas not directly EU-related, most notably NATO and security, where, you know, all of NATO now has the problem that with a shrinkage of all the European economies, the 2% target, you know, is a lot less money in terms of a defence spend. And yet the security threats from Russia and elsewhere are mounting. So, you know, in Britain, a kite was floated in the last couple of weeks. Maybe our defence review should mean we give up tanks. We mothball all our tanks and we rely on Europeans to provide tanks and we'll just do drones and high tech stuff. Well, the idea, you know, of that sort of class war division of labour, where Britain does the high-tech stuff and the plodding French and Spaniards and Germans do the tanks and foot soldiers, you know, would even when Europe was its most coherent would have been a difficult sell. Uh, But at a time when you're going to see potential pulling apart of Britain and Europe's foreign policy, with Britain going in a more Atlanticist direction and Europe really starting to establish some distance between itself and the US. You know, the idea of a shared defence capability supporting a coherent, aligned foreign policy, I think remains very increasingly implausible. You talk about Britain's Atlanticist ambition, but how much of a warm embrace do you think it's going to find there under whatever administration emerges after November? Well, I think, you know, on the trade side, you know, Britain's already got a cold shower it didn't anticipate. You know, it originally hoped to get a US trade deal done this year, and that's slipped past the election deadline. But, you know, even for a second term Trump presidency, which would prioritise this, you know, trade deals are getting harder and harder. Britain is walking away from a system where Europe's trade deals were largely set at a time of the high watermark of, you know, international trade. Thereafter, every trade deal has a higher barrier to pass in terms of, you know, local sort of protection of food quality, but also of other product quality, of environmental and social rights, all good stuff. But it just means that the idea of quick and dirty trade deals and Britain being able to point to a trade deal post Europe, which is better than the one it had under its European arrangements with the US or pretty much anywhere else, looks increasingly implausible. I think beyond that, while, you know, there is no doubt that you know, if Trump was re-elected, the Johnson government might get a sort of four-year reprieve in which US policy continued to focus disproportionately on the British relationship. That, you know, with any return to normality in American politics, you know, a Biden presidency or whoever became president, Republican or Democrat four years from now, you know, there will be an inevitable realignment of US Atlanticist ambition away from the UK to Berlin and Paris. Because, you know, that's where the economic power and increasingly the security partnership will belong. And, you know, that in turn will be a smaller sum than it used to be because there will be more US attention to the Pacific Asia region as well. So, you know, there are going to be long term cost to the UK, which, you know, I think are barely recognised by large parts of the British political class at this stage. So I want to go back to the defence and security policy question and specifically to NATO. Do you see the alliance, which has been remarkably resilient, despite a lot of changes in the world since its raison d'etre disappeared, now may have reappeared, but you know, the alliance has, has gone through a lot. Do you think it really is threatened by Brexit? I think it's one of a number of threats. And, you know, the Brits will double up on their commitment to NATO because, you know, they certainly would not want to be the, you know, architects of NATO's unravelling. And I don't think it is going to unravel. I think, you know, that NATO headquarters will be there in Brussels in 10 or 20 years. But it's, you know, like a lot of 
bits of my beloved United Nations. You know, you can still have the headquarters buildings, the bricks and mortar remain there and the staff file in and out in the mornings and evenings. But the, you know, potency and power of the institution can be sharply diminished. And I think the difficulty for NATO is that in a host of other threats, Greek Turkey, uh, rising Russia threat on the east, the challenges of a the rise of China in a sort of longer term way. To add to that, again, this self-inflicted wound of a UK tracking its own path separately from Europe in terms of economic and foreign policy terms is going to further impede the coherence and effectiveness, both the political voice, but also the operational projection, if you like, of NATO power. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we're talking to Lord Mark Malk Brown about Brexit. So I want to talk about Russia, and I want to talk about EU Russia policy without Britain and British Russia policy without the EU. What happens? Well, I think on the second, you know, Britain has already been identified, I think, by uh, Russia, or at least by the Putin regime as, you know, a weak link. And many of us thought that the attempted killing of Skripal and his daughter in Salisbury, you know, was a real kind of signal of Russian intention, because Putin has never been comfortable with the role of London as a refuge for his uh, domestic oligarch critics or dissidents. It's an ambivalence because, you know, actually culturally Russians always have enjoyed London and Britain and, you know, there are many Putin loyalists who also are, have second lives in London. But I think there is amount those around Putin at this point a visceral dislike for the British. They look at the British in a strange way, almost culturally through some kind of perverse mirror. They see Britain as, you know, what happens to post-imperial countries. They become weak and, and frivolous and spoilt and flabby. And I kind of see the commentary of not just Putin himself, but Sergei Lavrov, an old friend and colleague from my UN days, this sort of emotional anti-British position, and I simply don't see that changing. Anti-Russian bug has also got thoroughly lodged inside the sort of populist conservative end of the Tory party and its tabloid media outlets. So I think the UK-Russia relationship on both sides, I'm sorry to say, is only going to get worse, I think. I don't think that means that you know, either side's going to take a swing at the other, but it's just going to deteriorate, you know, because actually on this issue, Britain was, in a sense, you know, balanced by the more mature behaviours of, say, Germany and Merkel. So now what does that mean for EU-Russia relationships? Well, we are speaking, you know, shortly after the Navalny poisoning, and we're speaking while the Belarus crisis, you know, is still very much there. And, you know, I think for Germany, it is a wake-up call. And for that matter, for Macron and France, who've also, you know, tried to improve the relations with Putin. I think for both countries, it's a wake-up call to the fact that while the economic dependence on Russian gas remains, any expectation of a real sort of substantive reset of the relationship while Putin and those around him remain in power in Russia, you know, remains extremely difficult. So while I think there'll be huge efforts to protect the economic core of the relationship and huge efforts to prevent unnecessary sort of rhetorical runaway attacks on each other, you know, this is going to remain a coldish relationship between Europe and Russia indefinitely. When you're looking at all these issues that are now going to face Europe and Britain separately, where do you think the biggest challenge is going to be apart from Russia, say? I mean, for instance, the Eastern Mediterranean, they seem to be lined up on different sides of the various parties to potential conflicts. Do you see anything 
much worse happening? I mean, you've spoken of Britain becoming the weak link, but wasn't EU policy already pretty uh, fractured anyway? Yes, it was. And, you know, I think this is what makes this so difficult in that Britain, if you take the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, actually does really have some remaining diplomatic assets in Cyprus. It has traditionally had good relations with both Greece and Turkey. You have a Greek prime minister at the moment who's very sort of Anglophile in many ways. And, you know, a series of British governments have really worked hard at trying to represent Turkey's voice and interests in Europe right back, if if we can all remember back long enough ago when Turkish accession to the EU was a potentially live issue. And so this is one where the British chair being empty in terms of EU foreign policy is not at all helpful in containing this Eastern Med crisis. And, you know, I think the Eastern Med crisis is one, and Hugh, you're much more expert on this than me, but, you know, is one which really could run and run because exactly the kind of crisis that builds slowly when a set of relationships are ignored over a considerable stretch of time. And we now have five, six years in which Turkey has not been well managed by either the US or Europe. We've got a Greece is actually rather well led at the moment, you know, best government arguably it's had in years, but which simply can't just sort of back off in terms of these oil and gas interests in the region. And again, it's the kind of issue which in more normal times would be susceptible to a properly mediated solution. This is about different countries maritime rights. You've got a Turkey which is not signed up to the law of the sea, therefore has difficulty claiming in a legally sort of sound way what it thinks is it. And you've got a Greece which has taken advantage of various agreements to claim full maritime rights beyond each of its islands. And, you know, these are obviously contradictory claims, but they're exactly why you have diplomats and mediation. But at this point, because the relationships have been so neglected there, it's kind of like a wild garden where earlier in the year you could have gone in and trimmed the roses. Now the damn thing is weeds a mile high and it's hard to know how you can put a trusted mediation process in place. So you're describing a very chaotic future for all of us, all because the United Kingdom decides to get out of the European Union. Is that the reason? Or is Brexit actually more a symptom than a cause, that it's just one more instance of a world order that is not durable? You know, So it's not so much causing these things as it's just one more of the manifestations. I think it's a very good question. The short answer and the, the sort of more philosophical answer, the short answer is, you know, this isn't all happening because Britain's leaving. These are problems like the Eastern Med, which are there for other reasons, Russia, other reasons, but which Britain's absence kind of makes them harder to manage. And secondly, I think something which really does bear repeating is, you know, in some ways, Europe is stronger without Britain, because, you know, Britain was such a discordant voice. And again, this rescue plan this year for recovery after COVID has an ambition, both in size and and policy terms, which wouldn't have been there if Britain was still holding on to the coattails of Europe and stopping progress. So you do, in some ways, have a stronger Europe because of Britain's departure. Um, But I think to the sort of philosophical longer term is our whole sort of modern state system crumbling and is Brexit just a symptom of that as we look around the world and see the rise of you know authoritarian governments in so many places populist governments if you like obviously our politics globally is in a very sour place and the kind of win-win multilateral collaboration which was the hallmark of my period in international affairs at the UN and elsewhere is very much uh, in eclipse around this highly transactional, bilateralized, winner-takes-all, make America great again theory of international affairs. The fact is, the very issues which drove the rise of multilateralism in the first place, which was shared problems that needed shared solutions, you know, 
that latter agenda is growing in importance. You know, the obvious candidates that are always mentioned in these such discussions, whether it is climate change, whether it is uh, migration, whether it is structural nature of employment and jobs across the world, whether it's inequality across the world between countries as well as in them, is still a whole set of problems. But ultimately, it's a more multilateral, burden-shared politics with a kind of more rational uh, approach to problem-solving. So far from giving up on multilateralism, I think the new opposition, where the outsiders now, the populists are the incumbents. And, you know, I think first in the election in the US in November, and then in an array of elections thereafter, we're going to see how that political option does at the ballot after the ravages of this year and the economic contraction economies have seen. I hope politics may revert to a kind of mature and normal. I don't think it'll go backwards to what it was, but I think there's a prospect of a, a little bit saner future in terms of the political discourse. You've talked about the important work you did for multilateralism in the past, but you, in the last four or five years, you've been personally engaged in your own country to fight for these values. What was it that made it so difficult and what has do you feel are the forces on the ground that you were unable to overturn to bring multilateralism back to where I think all three of us would like to see it? It was a fascinating thing and, you know, it continues now. I mean, this Best for Britain group that I still chair, you know, does both economic research and opinion research all over the country. But the most striking findings are in the industrial northeast where people are willing to defy their own economic future with jobs in car plants, etc., by voting for Brexit and, you know, continuing now to to have turned out their long-serving Labour incumbent MPs and put in Tories in the election at the end of last year. And, you know, when you press them in the opinion research and point to them that, you know, car plants employing, you know, being almost the sole source of employment in some of these constituencies, that there is a real risk those car plants will go. You know, one, they don't believe that necessarily, but if they do acknowledge it, their defence is a cultural, not an economic one. You know, I think many of us date the current crisis to the way the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 9 was was handled and others would argue it even predates that by decades but you know you saw an acceleration at least from that date where huge fortunes could be made in the financial markets and yet it was those same financial markets particularly the banking sector which is blamed for that financial crisis yet the haircut imposed to recover from that crisis fell on working people in Britain, America, Europe, not on those who were the perceived instigators of the crisis, who got richer and richer on the wall of cheap money that was pushed out uh, as the recovery measure. And I'm talking in these quite simplistic words because I think that's how this political battle has gotten framed. And so, you know, there is a very common route between the political forces that put Donald Trump in the White House and the political forces that secured Brexit here. And why did they get away with it? Because of a consuming middle-class complacency, which was saw our own lives getting steadily better and those of our most successful counterparts getting dramatically better, and who simply ignored the rising inequality of those getting left behind, losing factory jobs which were going overseas, etc., etc. And the fault for what's happened lies squarely on us too. The exciting thing is what's a new politics which blends addressing the concerns of those who think of themselves as left behind, while still, you know, accelerating a country's competitive transition to a new kind of post-industrial services and knowledge-based future. Mark, thank you so much. This has been really a fascinating conversation and a great way to come back from our summer break. Uh, Really appreciate you joining us. Well, yeah, thank you. And Hugh, thanks too. And we hope you, our listeners, also enjoyed our first podcast back after summer break. If you would like to learn more about Best for Britain, you can check out 
that website. It's bestforbritain.org. You should also uh, follow Lord Mark Malik Brown on Twitter. That's at Malik underscore Brown. Easy enough to find. And for more crisis group work on multilateral challenges, you can check out our website too. That's crisisgroup.org and just the global issues page and you'll come up with uh, lots of multilateral diplomatic reading. And you should also follow Crisis Group and Hugh and me on Twitter. Crisis Group is at Crisis Group. Hugh is at Hugh underscore Pope. And I'm at Olya, O-L-Y-A, Olaker. Also, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. That's also at Crisis Group. And do feel free to tweet at us if you like something or don't like something on the podcast. We will be paying attention and we will listen. If you're listening through iTunes as well, it would be really great if you could leave us a rating or a review. War and Peace is part of the Europod network. Check out some of their other podcasts uh, and learn more about Europe. And we'd like to give big thanks to our producer, Bull Media, and to Miranda Sunnox, who got War and Peace started a year ago and has helped coordinate it ever since. I think we're entering the final stretch of the podcast she helped organize and she's already being missed biggest thanks as always go to you our listeners Uh, welcome back we're looking forward to chatting with you again in two weeks but for now goodbye and a goodbye for me too war and peace a podcast by the international crisis group